Father, this morning we do come before you to worship your holy name. And we have far more than 10,000 reasons to proclaim your greatness, your goodness, uh, the blessings that you have poured out on us. And so we simply pause in the midst of our lives to say thank you. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for life eternal instead of what we deserve. God, you have given us hope. You have given us healing. You've given us life. And today we simply want to praise you and offer up our lives as living sacrifices. And so we yield our hearts, our minds, our wills to you and pray that you would speak to us and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27. Uh, Matthew chapter 27. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles that look just like this in the pews all around you uh, and uh, turn to page 1061. That's where you'll find Matthew 27. And if you don't have a Bible, you need a Bible, please take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God and let it change your life as you read it. Hey, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but uh, next Sunday is Easter. You know, some of you are aware of it. Some of you are like, Easter already? Yes. Uh, You know it's almost Easter when t-ball season kicks off, right? Baseball season, I know a lot of you are are kind of tired from yesterday all day playing and uh, Uh, Your kids are excited, but they're exhausted too. Hey, next weekend is Easter, and I'm going to ask a favor of some of you. Uh, And and you and God can have this conversation, or maybe you're you're okay with it. But but Easter weekend is the the biggest weekend of our year, obviously. A lot of people come to church that don't usually come to church. And we love our guests. And uh, But here's the thing. Uh, If you look around this room and you realize it's comfortably full in here, and if you add another 100, 150 people, uh, it's going to be kind of like crazy in here. And, uh, and so we're going to ask some of you, 50, 75 of you, uh, if you would consider uh, coming to church on Easter Saturday. And uh, Mike repent. Uh, but uh, he's one of our deacons, so he'll change his mind. But uh, see, here's the thing. We, we know that uh, we're going to have guests. We're probably going to have about 2,000 people next weekend. And, uh, and we want to provide parking and space for seating and stuff like that. So if there's about 50 or 75 of you that could come on uh, Saturday night, 4.30 or 6, 6 is less crowded. There's going to be more room there. Uh, I'd love to have you come then. Uh, Anybody feeling led right now just to say, yeah, count me in. We'll we'll make that sacrifice. Thank you. You're serving God by when you come to church because you're opening up seats for people who who need to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and God will honor that sacrifice, that gift. So thank you very much. Um, Hey, have you ever been mistaken for someone else? You you ever had someone, you know, you got that twin out there and somebody starts talking to you and you're like, I don't have a clue what they're talking about, who they are talking about. Or maybe, uh, even better, you got a brother or sister that looks just like you or a friend that people mistake you for and they start talking to you and you actually understand the conversation and they got the wrong person and you're just kind of smiling and nodding and and on the inside laughing because you don't know whether to tell them or not. See, that kind of stuff happens around here all the time. If you're not aware of it, our senior pastoral team is named Chad, Chet, and Chad. Because God has a sense of humor. (laughs) Right? And people get us confused all the time, which is very perplexing to me. I understand the names are similar, but when you start looking at it, there's Chad Garrison. That kind of looks like me. And there's Chad Merle. Doesn't look like me. We, We call him the O.C., and then there's Chet Anderson, who doesn't look like anybody else. And, uh, <laughs> and the thing is, uh, we don't look alike, but people get us confused all the time. They call us the wrong names. What's really funny is they call up the church, and they're not sure which one of us they've talked to. You know? And so they'll be talking to me, and they're sure they talked to me, and it wasn't me. And so we'll start playing this game where we go, can you describe the pastor that you talked to? <laughs> you know, because I'm the old guy, because I have gray hair even though Chet's actually older than me. And Chet, well, he's the, let's see, he's the big guy, he's the loud guy, he's the southern guy, Uh, you know, all those things. Chad, well, uh, O.C., he's just the little one or the young one. (laughs) Look, we don't make up these designations, but we have a lot of fun with them uh, as we listen to people. The thing I don't really, I I just can tell you this, thing I don't understand is how people can get me confused with them because I have glasses and hair. (laughs) 
Hey, it's true, all right? I'm just saying, it's kind of one of those obvious things. And, and uh, if my hair falls out in the next week, then you know God thought that was funny too. So, now I share that with you because today we're looking at uh, continuing our series of persons of interest. We're looking at fascinating people in the Easter story, and we're going to look at a man named Joseph. And, and this gets confusing because Joseph is one of those names that occurs in the Bible uh, more than once. And people get confused. Even people who like, grew up going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school, which you should have your kids in vacation Bible school. Julie mentioned that. Uh, but uh, even people who, who've been exposed to the Bible for their whole lives get confused when you say Joseph. Which Joseph are you talking about? Because there's more than one. So let me give you a really brief primer on the three major biblical Josephs so that you can keep it straight going forward and know which one we're talking about today. First of all, you have the Old Testament Joseph. Okay, his story is in Genesis. Uh, it, it's like long. It's like a third of the book. And, and, uh, and he's a significant player in being one of the patriarchs of Israel. In fact, his dad was Israel, named Jacob. God changed his name to Israel. And he had 11 brothers. The 12 of them comprised the 12 tribes, right? So, so this Joseph had 11 brothers. Uh, he also was known for having a you know, multicolored coat. Uh, they made a Broadway play about him and everything. So uh, he had this coat. His brothers didn't like him. They sold him into slavery. He went to Egypt. He rose to prominence, uh, saved Egypt from uh, starvation, from this big famine, saved his family. And in the end, when he could have had revenge on his brothers, he forgave them. That's Old Testament Joseph. We're not talking about him today. And then you've got, well, let's call him Christmas Joseph, Okay. He's the guy that when you, you know, think about Christmas, you think of Mary and, yeah, the couple, right? Because they were engaged, and Joseph found out Mary was pregnant. He knew he wasn't the dad. He was going to divorce her until an angel came to him and said, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because that which is conceived of her is born of the Holy Spirit, and she's going to give birth to a son called his name Jesus, and he will forgive his people from their sins. <sighs> so he, uh, hey, it's kind of fun doing that. But anyway, the, so he, he's the one. They went to Bethlehem together. Uh, there was no room in the inn, so they laid the baby in the manger. Shepherds came and worshipped. Wise men, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You guys know the story really well, right? We're not talking about that Joseph either. The one we're talking about, it, guess, is Easter Joseph. Joseph of Arimathea. And, uh, and so we're going to talk about him at length today. So who is Joseph of Arimathea? Matthew chapter 27, uh, verse 57 through 61, is one of four short accounts of Joseph of Arimathea, one in each of the Gospels. Uh, and he comes into play right when Jesus dies. He's already been, Jesus has already been crucified. Uh, he's been up there about six hours on the cross. And he dies, and that's where the story picks up. Verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were, were there sitting opposite the tomb. Now, this is one of the four accounts. Uh, and by the way, Joseph of Arimathea is one of the few people who are mentioned by name in all four Gospels. Um, in fact, I think he's the only man who isn't an apostle or who isn't um, uh, one of the bad guys who's mentioned in all of the Gospels. And, and so he has this place of prominence. In fact, I'd encourage you to go home and, and look up uh, the account of Joseph of Arimathea in, in each of the four Gospels. They're all about a paragraph long. And you can see uh, the, the story or the picture of this, uh, this man. So here's what we know from the four Gospels about Joseph of Arimathea. First of all, he was a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. He was rich and powerful. The Sanhedrin was the 71-man uh, ruling group of the Jews. Of course, Rome was in charge, uh, Pontius Pilate, he was the governor, and so he kept the peace and collected taxes. The Sanhedrin pretty much did everything else. They, they set the, the laws, the religious laws, they oversaw the, the temple, all of that. 
They are also the ones who condemned Jesus to death and handed him over to Pilate. And while Scripture tells us that Joseph did not consent to their actions, neither did he stand up and protest. So he was a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin, and then we know that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple of Jesus. He was a secret follower of Jesus. Uh, he was secret because he was afraid of being cast out of the Sanhedrin. He was afraid of the religious leaders, uh, and he was afraid uh, because he was uh, rich and connected and secret because of his position and his status and his influence. He was a secret follower of Jesus until Jesus' death. And then he asked for Jesus' body. He went to Pilate, and Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already deceased, and so he sent soldiers to have him check it out. They came back and said, yes, he's, he's dead. Uh, and so Pilate, in an official way, gave Jesus' corpse to Joseph of Arimathea. He had legal custody, if you will, of the body of Christ. And then, not only did he uh, ask for the body, but he, by the way, he had a friend with him when he asked for the body, a guy named Nicodemus may have heard of him in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. He came to Jesus by night as well. He was a Pharisee and part of the Sanhedrin. And so they asked for Jesus' body, and then Joseph laid the body of Jesus in his new tomb. Joseph had the tomb carved out of rock for himself because that's what rich people did. And, and understand, this was a, a very privileged thing because when you're living in a country that people have been in for thousands of years, they've already used pretty much all the natural caves as graves, as tombs. And, and so, uh, you know, this was a brand new one. It wasn't recycled. It, it, it hadn't been used before. It was cut out just for Joseph. And he gave up his tomb for the body of Jesus. He rolled the stone in front of it to seal it. That was typical for that, their custom. And the women were watching so that they could come back after the Sabbath and anoint Jesus' body with oils and spices, give him a decent burial, is what they wanted to do. So this is what we know about Joseph of Arimathea. We see a very little bit of information during a specific action at a very crucial moment. Now let's talk about the significance of Joseph's actions. I mean, why is this important enough to be recorded in all four of the Gospels? You ever wonder that? I mean, if you're like me and you grew up in church and you read this account, you could have answered Joseph of Arimathea as a trivia question uh, all day long. You, you got that part, but the why, why was this a big deal? I, I mean, after all, does he really deserve this kind of spotlight in the Gospels there at the crucifixion of Jesus when he was a secret disciple? As a matter of fact, he does. His actions were tremendously important especially if you know what they did with the bodies of most executed criminals in that day and age. You see, in the first century, in Jerusalem and elsewhere, uh, Rome executed people all the time. Criminals, uh, rebels, or whatever, they'd, they'd crucify them. And when they were done, they'd take the bodies down and they'd throw them on the trash pile. I mean, they didn't have landfills like we have, but they had ravines all over the place. And they would throw, people would throw their trash in the ravines. They'd throw, you know, carcasses of animals. Uh, they would throw uh, dead bodies of, of paupers because nobody was there to bury them uh, in those places. And, uh, and then there the, the dogs, the vultures, the scavenging animals would eat them. Uh, they would burn trash. People around the world, third world countries still burn trash. They'd start fires. And, and, and that, was, that was normal. In fact, around Jerusalem, there's a valley uh, of Hinnom, which uh, is used, was used for that purpose back in that day. They talk about it all the time. In fact, that's the place we get the net word Gehenna for. Gehenna is the word translated in your Bibles as hell. As hell. Because it's literally a place where the worm never died and the fire never went out. Had it not been for Joseph of Arimathea... Jesus would have been thrown on the trash pile. Because where were, his, where were his disciples? They'd run away. They'd hide. Okay, we know that John and Mary were there, but they lived in Galilee. What are they going to do with the body of Jesus? They don't have any place to bury him. You see, this is how significant Joseph's actions were. If there is no Joseph of Arimathea who claims the body of Jesus, then there's no body to resurrect on Easter morning. And there's no tomb, 
no empty tomb to discover by the women. Wow. That means that God used Joseph of Arimathea to establish the resurrection story that we celebrate. Get this. God used a rich, connected, powerful man who was a secret disciple who didn't even protest publicly when Jesus was railroaded and condemned to death to change the course of history as we know it. To set up the Easter story that the entire church has been celebrating for 2,000 years. Is that cool or what? I mean, that's just amazing stuff that God does those kinds of things. And he uses people like that. That's why Joseph's actions were so significant. That's why he's mentioned four times in the Gospels. Well, that's pretty cool. But what's the significance to us? What does that matter to us? I mean, it's a nice story, but what difference does it make? What does God want us to know from the life of Joseph of Arimathea? Here's a couple of things that I noticed about Joseph that I think connect with, with us or may connect with you uh, this morning. First of all, Joseph wasn't a spiritual superstar. Uh, he was not one of the 12 apostles. He, he was not the guy following Jesus all over the countryside for three years. Uh, he, he never became a great preacher or teacher or evangelist or leader in the early church. Uh, he didn't write part of the New Testament. In fact, uh, after this episode, he's never mentioned again in the Bible. And he was a quiet disciple, secret disciple, if you will. So why does that matter to us? Well, you may be sitting here today and you may not be a spiritual superstar. You may not get a title like pastor or deacon or leader. You may not hold the microphone or, in my case, get to wear the microphone. You may not get in front of the spotlight, have the lead in the passion play or sing on the praise team. You may not be a teacher or a missionary or evangelist or a life group leader. You might even think, hey, I'm pretty much a quiet follower of Jesus myself. But God used Joseph of Arimathea to change the world. And God can use you to change the world. To make a difference in the story of redemption. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, understand, please, that you are important to the story that God is still writing. God has ordained you to make the difference. Maybe not in, like, you know, the holiday that we all celebrate as the biggest holy day of the year, but in the life of people, in the life of a community, in the lives of those around you, God has a key part for you to play, just like he had a key role for Joseph of Arimathea to play. See, God's not looking for superstars. He's looking for servants. And if you're willing to serve him, then God can use you significantly. So Joseph wasn't a spiritual superstar, but here's the thing. Joseph stepped up when everyone else ran away. Uh, here's just a reality check kind of question. Where were the super spiritual, hyper committed, soon to be apostles when Jesus died? Yeah, they were hiding. They ran away. They were silent. They were afraid. And Joseph courageously stepped up and cared for Jesus. He's the guy who stepped up when everyone else ran away, and he took the body of Jesus, and he took the risk, and, and he's the one who did what only he could do at that moment. He did what God needed him to do and what God asked him to do. I mean, because the apostles were not lining up at Pilate's uh, palace going, hey, can we have the body? They abandoned ship at that point. And Joseph stepped up. What is God asking you to do? Is there a task? Is there uh, a responsibility that you can do that no one else can do or no one else wants to do or no one else is aware needs doing? What does God want you to step up or 
What does God want you to step into? So that you can make a difference whether anyone else is or not. For instance, are you the only Christian friend that somebody has, somebody knows? Are you the only person that you know, goes to church on a regular basis, is trying to live the life for Christ that, that, that some people know? See, every one of us has the responsibility before God to, to reach out and share the good news to our friends, to our family, to the people that we care about. And, and the next seven days give you the best opportunity maybe ever to do that. Because you know somebody who doesn't go to church, and you can invite them to come to the Passion Play. Passion Play is tonight, two services, Monday night, Tuesday night. And by the way, we're not putting this on so that Christians can feel good. We're doing it so that you can bring your friends, and they don't have to listen to a sermon. They can see the message of the gospel plainly and clearly in an inspiring way. And God can meet them here, and you can introduce your friends to Jesus. They can't come to that? What about Easter? I don't care whether it's Saturday or Sunday. You can bribe them, all right? Just go, hey, look, come to church with me. I'll take you to lunch. We'll go to breakfast. We'll go to church. Uh, you know, whatever the, the, the works for you, then, then use that opportunity to bring your friends to a place where they can meet the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and what they decide is up to them. You don't have to convince anybody because the living God is here, and He's the one who changes hearts. He's the one who changes lives. But we got to be willing to step up and do it. So are you willing to step up, even if no one else does? Joseph stepped up when everyone else ran away. And then Joseph sacrificed personally to honor Jesus. Uh, he risked his status and his reputation asking for the body, and then he gave up his tomb that he had paid for with his money. And he did it for a dead Messiah who failed his followers. I, I mean, think about this. Joseph of Arimathea honored Jesus when he thought that Jesus had failed in his mission. Because everybody around them, the apostles included, believed that Jesus was going to be a political military Messiah, free them from Rome, and establish a new kingdom of David. And, and then he died. And the disciples gave up because Jesus died. And Joseph sacrificed to honor Jesus Jesus when he thought Jesus had failed. I mean, think about this. He gave Jesus his tomb, and he didn't realize that he was just going to be loaning it to him for a couple of days. Right? I mean, this was a full-blown sacrifice. I cut that out for me, and now he gets it. And see, we're on the other side of this. We read the story, and we know, ha, ha, it's going to be yours again in a little bit. You know, it's not really a sacrifice because you get it back. No, he doesn't know those things. We know those things. We know that Jesus isn't a political Messiah. We know that actually he's going to rise from the dead and he's going to shatter sin and death and hell. And he's going to give salvation to everyone who asks. And we get forgiveness of sins and eternal life by believing in him. We get that Joseph was clueless and yet he stepped up and he made this great sacrifice in order to honor Jesus when he didn't know that he was the King of kings and Lord of lords. Guys, we know who Jesus is. We know that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So what will you do to honor Jesus? Now, just for the record, he doesn't need to borrow your tomb. Okay? That's already off the table. But what gift can you give that makes an eternal difference to honor Christ? Now, some of you have never given anything tangible to Jesus. You've never sacrificed anything for him. And, and the temptation right now as I'm talking about this is to run away, and yet God is wanting you to step up. Because some of you in this room, I don't know who, you're, you're a lot like Joseph of Arimathea in that you're capable of doing what others can't or won't. And you're able to make uh, uh, a, a difference, an eternal difference in the lives of literally thousands of people in this community by investing in the ministry of Calvary. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed or not, but we're in a building program. We've got a, a property down on Sweetwater, and you know the part of the, the slab has been poured. They're going to pour more of it. They're doing block work. Uh, they're getting ready to do the steel structure. It's cool, isn't it? You guys like driving by there and seeing that and going, yeah, faster, faster, faster. Yeah, 
hope, you know, hopefully by next Easter we'll be in there. And, and, uh, and that'll be really cool because then I'll still ask some of you to come Saturday night. But, uh, but here's the deal. We need a little over $3 million to be debt-free when we occupy that building. And I can't write that check. Most of you can't write that check or, or even contribute. I mean, God call, calls all of us to be generous and faithful givers, okay? That's just, that's for everyone. But there's some of you that God has blessed in ways where you can step up and make a huge difference for the ministry of Calvary because here's what's going to happen. When we get in that new building on Sweetwater, God is going to send literally thousands of unchurched people to our church because we're going to have better parking and more seating and a little bit more room for a while, okay? I, I, just, I just believe that's what God's going to do, and He's going to use us to do that. But, but here's the thing. He's going to have thousands of people come in that need to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, and I would rather be investing our resources in expanding ministries instead of paying down debt. Now, Joseph was the hero of Easter. Maybe God's calling some of you to be the heroes of Havasu. To leave a legacy of life change in ministry at this place called Calvary for the next generation, for people who haven't been born yet, to experience the power of God in this place. Are you the one that God is asking to step up? And then some are here, and you're like Joseph, in that it's time for you to dispel the secrecy. See, Joseph, he uh, asked for Jesus' body, and it gave him away. It revealed that he was, really was a follower of Jesus Christ, and he believed in him, and, and, and he wanted to honor him. And there's some of you that, that need to take that step, that God is calling to step up and step out of the shadows and declare your faith in Jesus Christ once and for all. I mean, maybe you've been coming to Calvary for a long time, or, or maybe this is your first time here, and, and people you know, think you're a believer because you're sitting next to them, and, and you've heard the story, and you've kind of gone, yeah, I, you know, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe He died and was raised from the dead. And I, yeah, I, you know what? I think I'm committed to Him. The biblical definition of proclaiming our faith is this thing called baptism, where in front of people, we enter into the water and we're buried with Christ and we come out of the water, we're raised to a new life and that is our declaration of faith to the world that we're unashamed followers of Jesus Christ. And I believe there's some of you that are, that are sitting here that God is nudging right now and saying, hey, you need to do that. I want you to tell people that you belong to me. I want you to tell people that you're not ashamed of me. I want you to tell people that I've changed your life. And here's the thing. If that's the case, if that's you, then please tell one of the pastors before you leave. See him after the service in the, the greeting room, because here's what, here's what my dream is. Next week, on Easter weekend, when we've got more guests, more people who don't know Jesus, who need a life-changing relationship with the Son of God, uh, are going to be here than any other weekend of the year, that in every single service, we have somebody being baptized, proclaiming, showing uh, what life change in Christ looks like. Because I believe God's going to use your sermon, your testimony from the baptistry to challenge people who are sitting there, for God to, to nudge them, and that will be the strongest sermon that they hear that whole day. Now, so far, we've already got people just about for every service lined up, but hey, this is an 11 o'clock service, and before the service started, somebody told me, next week I'm going to get baptized in this service for Easter. Isn't that cool? God's already doing it ahead of time. See, here's the deal. That's one. Who else? Who else is God saying, I want you to step up. I want you to declare your faith. I want you to dispel the secrecy. I want you to take a stand for me because I took your sins upon myself. You see, God used Joseph of Arimathea in a great way. A guy who was hiding in the shadows, who didn't think that he could make a difference. And God used him to write history. Are you going to let God use your life too? If he wants to, beginning today. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for the gift that you have given us of eternal life. We don't deserve it, and yet we rejoice in the knowledge that you have forgiven us our sins through the blood of Jesus. And today we simply come to you to say thank you and to remember and to celebrate the life that you have given us. So Lord, let us hear your voice clearly. 
and give us the courage and the faith necessary to step up in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a moment, we're going to continue worshiping God. We're going to do so by celebrating communion, and we're going to invite everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ to join with us this morning. If, uh, if you're a believer in Jesus, then as the band leads us, we're going to invite you to step out from your seat and move to one of the tables around the room. There's three across the front and one in the back. Come to the table and take the bread, which represents Jesus' body, and the cup, which represents his blood. And go back to your seat. And there, when you're ready to say once again, Jesus, I believe in you. I commit my life to you. And I want to step up into whatever you have for me. Take the bread, which is his body broken for you. Drink the cup, which is his blood shed for the forgiveness of our 